There's much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Here in our studio is Monica de Bol. She is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Also with us, Peter Hakim is the president emeritus of the Inter-American Dialogue. From Sao Paulo, Joel Pinheiro da Fonseca is an economist and philosopher. And uh, the economist and author Rodrigo Constantino joins us from Miami. Welcome to all of you to the show. Monica, let me start with you here in the studio. As we just heard from our correspondent, uh, after six months in office, President Bolsonaro's approval ratings are falling. Um, in fact, one of the polls done in Brazil show that almost a third of Brazilians think that his government is either bad or terrible. What do you attribute to those falling ratings? Well, I think first and foremost, the state of the economy. Um, today also, the Brazilian Central Bank, which every week publishes the results from a survey that's conducted with market participants on projections for GDP and projections for other economic variables. For the 20th straight week, um, these projections have come down for both 2019 and now also for 2020. So market participants have this view that perhaps, you know, 2019 wasn't going to be so great, but then maybe by 2020 the economy would be picking up again. That now seems to be going the other way. So I think the sense that the economy has kind of stalled and that things are not looking very um, favorable for Brazilians right now and employment rates are still very high. Inflation has come down significantly. But that's a reflection of economic weakness. I think to a large extent, that explains the, the, the fall in, in approval ratings. In addition to that, there's obviously all the other sort of local issues, so crime and violence and um, some of these issues that were very, very front and central during the presidential campaigns and where people are still seeing, you know, not the kind of improvements perhaps that they would like to see. So, Monica, does this tell us that the business community doesn't have much confidence in this government at this stage? Well, I think the business community is kind of split. Um, there are some people that believe or still believe that the reform track that we're on, so Brazil has just recently passed in the first round of voting, there are several rounds of voting, but in the first round of voting, it has just approved a pension reform by quite a large margin within the Congress. Um, that margin was actually very surprising. And I think some still see you know, that as opening up the way for the reform track that this government has, um, has laid out. But others, I think, are coming more and more to the conclusion that you know, there's a lot that needs to be done in order to get this economy moving again. And perhaps just pension reform alone is not going to do the trick. All right, I want to talk about pension reform a little bit later in the show, but let me bring in uh, Joel from Sao Paulo right now. And Joel, clearly, as we've just heard, the economy is a priority for the new government. What do you make of Bolsonaro's performance in the past six months? Well, I think on the economic front, he has, the, he has had slow but steady progress. I think we're seeing a good uh, agenda of reforms. First, first is pensions reform, but then we'll have other ones such as tax reform. But on many other important areas, I think he has shown a complete disregard for the priorities of our country. One of them is education. He has, his first minister of education was sacked after three months as minister because he showed himself to be utterly incompetent for the, for the, for the role of minister. He did not know anything about the Brazilian education system. And the next one also does not seem to have any agenda of improving the quality of our schools and basic education does not seem to be a priority at all. I will also cite the environment, where the environmental minister is right now dismantling every single institution and structure that we have to protect the environment in this country, be it deforestation or CO2 emissions. All of this, these important areas are being completely left behind, and in some cases they're being even even confronted by the government, as if they were not seen as goals at all. So I'd say that we're having some progress on the economic front. They're doing what they should do, and we have a very good and, and professional economic minister. But on many other important areas, they're showing a complete disregard for the priorities of our country. Peter, what, in your view, are Bolsonaro's shortcomings? Do you see a well-thought-out vision here, a plan for the future, uh, or is the president caught between implementing these policies on the one hand and pleasing his, I guess, ideological supporters on the other? 
Well, I mean, the first thing is, of course, that he was elected because people were fed up with conventional politicians. And uh, they weren't really voting for him as much, or a good number of them were not voting for him, but they were voting for everybody else who occupied the political arena. So it's not surprising that when he suddenly has to begin to reduce some results, and particularly on the economy, which people were watching most closely, I think, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, he couldn't do it very quickly, and his uh, popularity began to decline. What's surprising in some ways that it's no worse than most other uh, presidents of Latin America at the time, uh, who are actually performing a lot better than he is. And uh, the fact is he has one-third of the population that thinks he's doing good or excellent as president. Uh, uh, I uh, think that uh, uh, Joel is right, that uh, there is some progress on the economy, at least there's apparent progress, enough to satisfy at least, I think, the business community that there is uh, some prospect of getting uh, uh, the Social Security reform through and this creating a certain momentum that might allow for a, a more positive on the economic side. But I also agree that the, the rest of the administration, I mean, he's not picked very good ministers in most cases. His relations with Congress, which are essential for, for governing in Brazil, are very weak. Uh, but he does have this uh, Social Security reform that, you know, is just beginning to open the door. And then he could claim some success for this uh, treaty uh, between Mercosur his trade agreement in, the, in South America with the, the European Union, which for 20 years had been languishing and suddenly came into. Uh, beyond that, it's very hard to sort of point to very much. All right, let me go to Rodrigo. Rodrigo, how would you rate the president uh, so far? I think he is scoring a uh, regular to good rate. Uh, first of all, I would take this polls with some skepticism. I think that if it were for the polls, he, was, he wouldn't, wouldn't be elected in the first place. But I think he's, uh, he's going down in terms of uh, popularity. And it has a lot to do with Monica, what Monica said. The economy is not doing fine. We still, has, uh, we still have 13 million unemployed people in Brazil. The economy is going to grow like 0.8% this year. And those important reforms are going through uh, with a lot of success in the Congress. 74% of congressmen approved in the first round the pension fund reform, which is something very uh, impressive, very amazing. Uh, the results of those reforms, they are in a good direction, in the right direction. They usually take time. So, yeah, we need to be a little patient here. But he was elected with a lot of high expectations. Part of that because of his speech against the Congress and uh, he's the guy that's going to do everything and uh, with the support of the people. And Brazil doesn't work like this. We need a Congress. There were a lot of turbulences in the beginning uh, between the executive power uh, branch and the Congress. And I think that they are in a learning curve. But if they approve those uh, reforms, the liberal agenda that economist uh, and minister Paulo Guedes has, I think the economy we're gonna, uh, we, will do much better uh, going forward. And that's going to improve his popularity probably. Right. Uh, Monica, you mentioned uh, pension reform earlier on. Let's get on to some specifics there. This is controversial. It's unpopular, this kind of reform that he's talking about. In fact, the former president, Michel Temer, wasn't able to implement any kind of pension reforms. How did Bolsonaro manage to do it? Mm. So um, pension reform has been under discussion in Brazil for the past three years, um, and very intensively so. Um, so I think part of the story is just that people have been saturated with information on, on pension reform. And I think there's a group within, within the Brazilian population, and I'm not speaking of the Brazilian population at large, but there's certainly a group within the population that understands the urgency of having some kind of pension reform in place, because without that, Brazil is really on a trajectory to have very serious fiscal problems in the medium term. 
So I think that's one side of the equation. But one really important side of the equation is the politics on the ground, the level of political dysfunction, and the level of polarization in the country. So it's kind of interesting, because when you look at that, you kind of come away with the following conclusion. There's a chunk of the population, and the 2018 election showed this very clearly, there's a chunk of the population which voted for Bolsonaro, which was not necessarily voting for Bolsonaro per se, but was expressing an anti-left sentiment. And then you have another portion of society which is very much, let's call it, the leftist camp. This divide, or this split, and the way that the country has polarized around these two groups essentially means that anything now that the left proposes, the anti-left will oppose. And anything that the left will oppose, the anti-left will support. So what's happened with pension reform is that the left has come out very strongly against pension reform, while this anti-left camp, whether or not they understand clearly what's at stake with the pension reform, but because they have seen the left being opposed to it, they automatically support it. And since they are in the majority right now, since the anti-left camp is in the majority, the reflection of that is that a, a, what would seem to be a very unpopular reform because of polarization has gained a lot of traction and has yep. gained significant, significant support from the population at large. And that's why we saw the results in Congress that we saw, you know, with about 75% of the deputies in the lower house voting in favor of reform in this first round of voting. Joel, Monica raises the issue of division in the country, polarization uh, in the country. Um, there were recently uh, demonstrations in Sao Paulo by both those who support pension reforms and those who are against it. Uh, how uh, deep is the divide in the country? Well, I, first of all, I fundamentally agree with what Monica said. I think this divide has much to do, on the one hand, with the left and right divide, and many people associated the left with all the corruption that we've seen in the last years in this country, and I think they're fed up with it, so they want something different. They want something radically opposed to that, radically opposed to the Workers' Party, and Bolsonaro filled that role. But there's also something else. There is, let's say, a deeper revolt against the whole political class and the whole political system. And then anyone who is seen a, a part of, as, as a part of that, even if they are on the right, they might be kicked out of their, of their candidacy, of their elected position. So, and Bolsonaro somehow, even though he has been in Congress for almost 30 years, since he was not a very relevant player in Congress, since he, from, from a certain moment on, started appearing on the media as someone who said absurd things and outrageous things against what was being done in Congress, he's seen now as an anti-establishment figure. And I think many people who support him are actually not that concerned with right or left politics. They're concerned with being anti-establishment, anti-system. Mm -hmm. And that's something which appeared in this country strongly first in the 2013 protests, which was a time when Brazilian economy was still doing very well, unemployment was very low. But even, even though that was the case, people took to the streets to protest what they saw as unresponsive government and unresponsive politics. Then later in 2018, we had a protest of truck drivers who went on strike and dangerously left cities um, without supplies for some days. And many of them were also wanting, the demanding, for instance, a military dictatorship, anything to get the political class out of the way, out of government, because it is seen as essentially corrupt. And now Bolsonaro, in taking office, he has made one of his most important talking points, how even negotiating with Congress, which would be the essence of what political activity is negotiating, giving this and taking that and making proposals, seeking compromise. He takes that and one of his main talking points is that this is a corrupt practice in yeah. itself. And apparently there are many people who are believing him and, and who are with him in that. Peter, Brazil spends about 13% of its GDP on social security. That's way above the 8% average spent by most uh, G20 nations. And then if we add to that unemployment, the um, question is, uh, was there recognition on the part of Congress and on the part of the Brazilian electorate, for that matter, that this had to go through if the economy was to survive? Well, I think there's some recognition, clearly. Yeah. But at the same time, I think Monica is right, that it had to do with political maneuvering and political positioning, uh, probably more than, than the specifics of what the 
the uh, the amendment for uh, Social Security reform involves. In other words, this was a political push that was done uh, more than anything else, and they got it through. Uh, I think that that's what I consider, you know, it's part of the absolutely necessary agenda. If Bolsonaro is going to have any, he's got to do something about the economy. Uh, this is a good first start if he can get that going, but it's going to take time, and he may lose a lot more of his popularity as that time goes on. And there's others, the violence and the corruption or other issues, but they're harder to measure. People feel they, they can measure very quickly how the economy is. And then, of course, there's the whole other side is what I call the ideological agenda, which is creating so much uh, sort of resistance, uh, whether it's the social issues like gay marriage, uh, abortion, et cetera, the sort of question of gun uh, ownership and whether it should be expanded, uh, questions of the environmental issues. And these are not only, a, you know, very irritating to many in Brazil. They're offensive to the Europeans, and they're offensive to many in the United States, and worldwide, which are creating new problems for Brazil, I think, over time in, its interna in the international arena. All right. Rodrigo, one more point on pension reform. And as we've just heard, there was a lot of political maneuvering behind this, a lot of politics in this. Uh, and how much do you think was what Bolsonaro uh, did amounting to real change? Because there are also reports that to get that pension reform legislation passed, he had to support millions of dollars uh, in infrastructure, pork barrel projects for congressmen and congresswomen uh, in their home states so he could get their vote. Uh, so in, in one respect, was this business as usual? It was, and, and that was politics meant. Like, uh, Joel was right about it. Uh, there's uh, a part of the Bolsonaro supporters that believed in the new era, in like uh, everything is going to be different now. Uh, they are very anti-politics and anti-Congress, and that's not the, the way it, it usually uh, works. So Bolsonaro, in the end of the day, he needed to, to be more pragmatic, and I think he was, and it's good for him and good for the country, and bad for those more radicals uh, that want a kind of revolution and not reform agenda. So in the end of the day, I think he, he needs to sit down with, with congressmen, with the, with the parliament, and, and decide uh, what is achievable and what's not achievable. And he, he needs to compromise. That's uh, politics, not old politics, not new politics, just politics. That's what it, it means to do politics. But uh, I think there's another part of it that is uh, the social media uh, improved, empowered the, this right-wing people. They were very tired and angry about the bias in the, in the mainstream media. So that's a, an important issue also for Bolsonaro. And it was the same thing that explained uh, Trump's success in the United States and the Brexit in the United Kingdom. Uh, people were uh, consuming only one side news, opinion, in the, in the mainstream media. And now they had the social media to, like, uh, at least try to, to see the other side. And it, that's why I think they are going too uh, strong to the other side, because they, was, they, they were tired after a while, decades, I guess, <coughs> of only one side biased in the, in the news. Monica, I want to move on to another issue facing the government, another challenge, really. Uh, and this one's complicated, especially for our international audience. And that is Brazilian media are reporting, uh, or recently revealed, what appears to be collusion between a judge and a prosecutor in the removal of former President Lula da Silva. Um, will this hurt the current government? Well, first of all, the issues that are at play here and the revelations that are sort of coming out, we still haven't seen the full extent of what these revelations will be. Yeah. They do um, implicate former Judge Sergio Moro, who is the current Justice Minister for Bolsonaro and who was at the forefront of the corruption investigations, what we call the Lava Jato or the car wash investigations. They also involve a, a public prosecutor who was also part of the Lava Jato, is part of the Lava Jato investigations. The Lula part of things is actually a smaller um, part of this 
trove of information that apparently um, you know this this one media group in Brazil has received and that you know leak leaks and other things and that they, they've been slowly sort um, gradually making you know revelations about this to the Brazilian public at large the conversations that have come out between the judge and the prosecutor affect not just what happened with Lula but more broadly it brings sort of a, a question mark about the whole car wash operation about the whole Lava Jato operation and the question is you know to what extent were red lines crossed and to what extent were boundaries not met or you know simply ignored mm -hmm. um, in the process of conducting the investigation so for the for for people to sort of understand what this means there were conversations between former judge Sergio Moro and, and this public prosecutor that very clearly point to collusion between the two and point to the partiality of Sergio Moro the potential partiality I'm not a, uh, a, right. a legal expert but the potential partiality that might have existed this is creating a lot of problems for Sergio Moro himself um, it's at the moment not creating huge problems for Bolsonaro. In fact, what's happened is Moro was always kind of, because of what he represents in terms yeah. of fighting corruption, he has always been seen as sort of, you know, the, the person that was most important in the Bolsonaro cabinet. Right. The tables have kind of now turned and Moro depends a lot on Bolsonaro for him to remain in place. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he does have a lot of popularity as seen in recent polls, as seen in recent demonstrations. So how these things are going to evolve going forward is, is yet to be seen, but there's a lot to unpack here and there's a lot of stuff that we have not yet seen. All right, Rodrigo, what are your thoughts on these revelations in the Brazilian media? No, I don't agree with Monica on that. First of all, I would question the source. Like the Intercept site is a, a very left-wing site and they, they are not willing uh, to, to, to show the, the source and the primary information. Uh, so uh, we are basing all that in uh, a guy that uh, historically has been, has been very anti-Bolsonaro and pro-Lula. Yeah. And also what we have right now, even even we take... 100% seriously the source. What we have right now, I don't think is a big deal at all. It's not collusion. Yeah. Uh, maybe he crossed some lines in terms of the, what, what we expect, ideally speaking, of a judge. But it's Brazil. They were chasing the most important and powerful corrupt people. It was a very successful operation. Uh, uh, I think it, it was too much noise for nothing. All right, very quickly, Monica, your response. Well, again, I'm not a legal expert, so right. I'm not going to make, you know, sort of hardcore judgments on whether or not this is, this, this is proper conduct, conduct or not proper conduct. I do want to make a correction to what Rodrigo was saying because it all came, up, came about, yes, with one specific person who we all know, it's Glenn Grinwald. Glenn he was involved in the Ed, Ed Snowden um, whistleblower scandal that happened mm -hmm. a few years ago. But now there are a couple of other very, very large media vehicles involved in the whole investigation right. process. And that's, you know, Journal Folha de, the, the Folha de São Paulo, one of the country's main newspapers, as well as one of the country's the largest newspapers, uh, uh, magazines, which Rodrigo used to write for, um, Veja magazine. So there's, there's now at least a three-pronged process right. of looking into these revelations as they come about. And yeah, it's taken up the media. You've got media cycles on end that are, that are going through these revelations. Okay, Joel, very quickly, I've just got about a minute left. Uh, just to round this off, we, see, we may see pension reform as an early victory for Bolsonaro. It still has to go through the lower house. But the issues that you mentioned, uh, environment, education, tax reform for that matter, uh, what does he have to do? What are you looking for? Well, I think we'll see from now on in pensions reform, the government uh, presented the project and Congress took it and managed to approve it. In tax reform, I think we're going to see the project coming from Congress itself. They're already talking to economists, so they're going to make a proposal. Con the, the president of the Chamber of Deputies is going to make a proposal, and I think we're going to see more autonomy, uh, a larger protagonism on the side of Congress. And the government, since it has burned so many bridges with Congress, with the media, with universities, with every single important public player, I think the government will either sit back and just enjoy the, the prob probable 
improvement of economic conditions, which might help its popularity, or will go into revolutionary mode and try to attack our institutions even stronger uh, in its speech and in its actions. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnon Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.